rolling. Uh, I'm going to go over, it's going to be a little bit of a history lesson, a little bit of uh, how this came about, and a little bit of cutting. Uh, you'll be amazed at how fast a rose engine can really cut. What first is ornamental turning? Rose engine is just part of what ornamental turning is. If you look at Holtz Apple's last volume, uh, they almost nowhere in there does he even bring up the word rose engine. In fact, I've not found it yet. Um, they were mostly into ornamental lathes. And what they were were, were lathes that had indexing heads on them and they could do some what they call fly cutting. In fact, you guys that have worked around machine shops, that's where the term fly cutter came from, is actually from these fly heads that they've developed to do this. Um, I'm smoking all your coffee. <laughs> I was going to say, because I don't have anything plugged in yet. <laughs> I didn't get excited. You know. <laughs> but ornamental turning is any, is when you put ornamentation on a part with something mechanical. You could take your lathe like this, you can take your lathe, if it has an indexing head, index, draw a line, index, draw a line, and drill holes freehand in it, that is not ornamental turning. Or you can carve stuff into it, that is not ornamental turning, that's all under the category of carving. You have to have some mechanical thing doing something mechanical to the part, if that makes sense, okay? Now, that being said, Ornamental lathe would have generally a, a big plate back here with holes in it, and it uh, might have 96 holes in a circle or 60 holes in a circle. They have a pin that would lock it to where it's going to be. They would move it over, do something, move it over, do something. They actually made a, almost like a recipe of what they were doing. Rose engine difference. In a, between a rose engine and an ornamental lathe is that this head will rock. Will rock. Okay. Some rose engines will rock and pump, but this is called rocking, that's called pumping out. Teaches some more rose engine language. Because <laughs> some of it doesn't make sense, but some of it does. Mine doesn't pump. It doesn't mean it's not a rose engine, just a rose engine that doesn't pump. Uh, what I'm going to do somewhere down the road is I want to have that pumping action. I'm probably going to put it on, cut this table, put some bearings under there so that the table moves. It doesn't matter what moves, it's just something has to move. <laughs> Okay, does all that make sense? Okay. And that, in an ornamental lathe, the only thing that differentiates it from a regular lathe is you can index it, lock it, and they've got a table on here that has an XY table. You've got to have that kind of a motion so that you can judge where you're going to be. If you go on the web, look under Nova. Uh, I don't remember what all, it's Nova's the company that they, they build lathes and such in Australia or New Zealand. And they sell an ornamental attachment to fit on your lathe. I've actually set one up for a fellow who got one as the first one in Charlotte. And I've got another friend that's got one that's still sitting on his kitchen table. He's waiting for me to come over and show him how to use it. Uh, it's not, not real complicated. The way it works is the cutter goes in the spindle. You've got an attachment out here that indexes your work. And you can do some tricked out stuff there. And it has a threading attachment so that you can thread. Um, this, this is just a rose engine. Uh, don't walk away from here thinking that this is the only way they look. This is just one of bunches of different designs. And pretty much today, unless you want to spend a lot of money, well, if you build your own, you're going to spend a lot of money. But if you want to save, if you want a rose engine, you're going to have to buy it. And there's only one company that I know of right now that's still building and that's uh, Lindell White in, uh, out in the Midwest in Kansas. 
and they sell you the stuff you got to end up putting it together. And their their machine, best I can understand, stripped down is like twenty five hundred bucks. So it's not it's not a cheap proposition. Uh, an ornamental lathe of pulse apples was sold on eBay not too long ago for twenty six hundred bucks. Then there was another one that I saw been about six months ago completely furnished with $65,000. So they're, they're not cheap machines. If you have to find one, let me know. And I'll try to talk to you out of it. <laughs> <laughs> the original cost on the Holtz Apple Rose Engine, that's not the Rose Engine, that's the ornamental lathe. You hear, you'll hear Holtz Apple's name, the family name, thrown around a lot. Um, they only made six or eight <coughs> Rose Engines in 120 years. These things were incredibly expensive. Uh, one place I read, they said the cost of a, Ro a Holtz Apple Rose engine was the same cost of an estate in London, in England, a country estate. And another one said that that Rose engine, whichever one, it was a Holtz Apple also, was the same price as a city block in London of apartment buildings. So these things were not cheap, cheap. Peter the Great had his own Rose engine designer and operator guy. And mostly the folks that used them were royalty, the, the sons of kings, the daughters of dukes, and that sort of thing, for having fun, entertainment. And they had guys that this is all they did. Uh, you guys can look through that book, you want to see some incredible stuff. And this was all done, we're talking 1700s. on a manual machine that they pump with their feet. And that was on a lathe, a Rose engine lathe. I'm pretty certain they've never tied it together, but I'm certain in my mind that that's what became the development of the milling machines. So the lathe came out way earlier than the, uh, way earlier than, uh, or way, way later, yeah, way earlier than the milling machine. The milling machine didn't come along until way later, okay? So you can see, I mean, they did incredible, incredible stuff, all on manual. And if you look at all their stuff, it's real, real gaudy. When we come down to it, to me, it's, it's seriously gaudy. Uh, I determined that when I did this stuff, that I was gonna do just enough to make it look nice but I can also understand why they made it that gaudy. You start going at it, and you go, I can do this. Well, heck, if I change this cam and do such and such, I can do this. Well, I'll do a little bit of stuff in here, and then I'll do a little stuff in here. Before long, they've got it all gaudy up. Okay. <laughs> and they have a chuck for everything that you can think of, and they've got cutting tools for everything you can think of. The uh, Holtz Apple engine I told you sold on eBay had a hundred chucks that came with it. I forget how many cutters. It was incredible. I mean, we're not talking uh, standard chucks like we're thinking of because they didn't even have anything near that. I mean, different chucks that would throw things in an ellipse and anything that fit on a spindle in those days was a chuck. Anything that fit on here, for the most part, was some kind of cutting frame. And I don't know if you all can see this. This the clear. I tried to, to print it where you were sitting back, you could see what it is. That's what a ornamental lathe looked like. No, foot pump. Foot pump. This is an Evans. I think it was like the 1700s. Okay. This is a modern ornamental lathe. This company, I think, went out of business not too long ago. They couldn't make any money making these things. This is considered a modern. And you can see the belt up here. See the, the belt in the top. And they pump. This one's run by electricity. Okay, and there's still lots of talk, concern about the type of cutting frame that I use and the type that this is. They're pretty certain this eliminated a lot of noise to travel down into your cutter. This, these people, I'm telling you, were serious about what they were doing. I don't know if you're familiar with super precision machining. These people were the forerunners of super precision machining. They had looked at everything. And that's the other one. And these ran, when they would pump this, 
the belt would run up, go around another pulley that was bigger, and it came down to a little tiny pulley. So you're speeding this this little cutter up seriously. And this the pulley, they don't have a tool hooked up on this one, but that belt right there went down and hooked into their cutting frame that spun the tool. What's, what's the year on those machines? What's the year? This one is around 1700, mm. okay, 1800. This one is 18, I can tell you the date on this one. They know where every Holtz Apple engine <laughs> and Rose engine went. Mm. This is a 18, this was made in 1838. They even said who they sold it to originally. This is a Rose engine. Okay. Let's say it's one of, some folks think that they did six and some folks think they did eight. All the Rose engine, there were, these weren't the only folks that, ever, that made them, there were other folks that made them, but I think you could take all the Rose engines ever made up until the last 10 years and put them in a small building easily and have room to walk around. Some of them were, were destroyed during World War II and World War I to melt down and get parts because these are the cams. You'll see on mine, my cams fit on the outside. These, the cams fit on the inside and they're clutter clustered with cams so that they can move what's called a rubber, a follower, to follow the cam, to actually push everything around. I can take mine off and put it on. Like I say, it's not my design, but I sure like it a lot. Okay? Now, another thing they used Bro's engines for before it became a hobby, I don't know if you all have seen old pocket watches pop a pocket watch open and there was this fancy design work inside there. It was very old, it was done on a rose engine. Rose engines were made also to cut metal. The one I'm designing for myself, I want to be able to do both. And it didn't have a spinning tool, it had a tool that would just sit there and they call it Guilloche. Um, French, French got involved with it so they would change it. So you turn this and as, this, as the cam's moving, and you'll see it on here, it's just peeling metal off. And they would do soft metal. Uh, there's a guy in northern uh, North Carolina that just bought one, brought one over from Russia. And as soon as he gets it running, he's supposed to call me and a friend of mine. We're going to go up and cut our hands on it. That's kind of neat okay, for doing metal. Um, printing plates for um, currency was done on what's called a linear rose engine. Um, they could do line stuff, repetitive. Rose engines do stuff repetitively, incredibly repetitive. Um, and they would make currency with these fancy designs, just like we have today, but today we, we use CNC machines. They would use these to make the background stuff. That's what made counterfeiters gave them a hard time because they could not repeat that exact, because they're trying to do it by hand, and, and the folks that are doing the plates are doing them with linear rows engines. CNC machine? Computer numerical control. Computer controls the table as it moves. You can do all kinds of stuff. Okay. Any questions? That's, that's pretty much the, the short run of the history part of it. Do you remember the name Rose engine came from? Oh, yeah. Um, Somebody asked me that. I can't remember if it was England or France, but they would do stuff like that. And they'd look at and they were doing stuff that looked like a rose. So they started calling it a rose. The uh, cams are not called, I think I'm the only person that, that runs one of these that calls them a cam. They're rosettes. And because you can combine them together, you, and I'll show you, I'll, I'll start out using one cam to show you what this does, and you can actually combine two cams and get some really tricked out stuff. Or you can make a cam to do whatever shape you want, and I, I'll show you that too. I thought I had, was the only one to do something. When, when did you first develop an interest in this kind of woodworking, and then secondly, what motivated you? Two years ago, I took my daughter over to the mall to buy Christmas gifts. I never go to the mall, I honestly. I haven't been there since, I don't think. <laughs> they had, hanging, I was sitting on, on the bench. My daughter was in buying whatever, spending money. And I was sitting there on the bench, and there's, was some place in the mall, they had this, these round cloth things hanging from the ceiling that were round. 
tapered down, came down like that, and they were cantered at both ends. And I was looking at it, so I bet I could turn that, even cantered at both ends, if I could figure out how to get that to move. So I started looking it up, and it um, somehow I got, came across something that said they were using um, wobble plate engines, which is a, a, a device you can put on a, a rose engine. It's a, a, imagine a plate sitting here, and this pumps this way, and you have a cam, and it's following it, it's turned this way. So that kind of jerked my brain a little bit, so I started delving into it more and found out that they kept talking about rose engine, this and that, and I started, okay, i got to find out what this is and kind of got sucked into the dark side. It's like the dark side of the force. <laughs> um, another little side note, my boss, um, I work at UNCC, my boss was so interested in what I was doing that he's funded a senior for a senior project to design and build a rose engine, mm. and I'm working with him. That's pretty neat stuff, though. Any other questions? If, if you. I have any questions when I'm going along, just say because I'll keep going. I could either excite you or bore you, bore you to death. Well, Roland, is a, if you take a regular lathe with an indexing hand and use a router to cut reeds and flutes. That's is, ornamental turning. Is that ornamental turning then? Right. Okay. But if you do it by hand, it's not ornamental turning. Okay. Ornamental turning, a regular turning, and, and uh, Rose engine. In fact, Holtzapfel called it complex turning. And they get, in his book, gets very involved with the mathematics and some of this stuff. Um, very hard to understand if you're reading 18th or 19th century English because they wrote that in England. Now, let me show you other things this will do. Well, yeah. This is done, pass that around, with what's called, the face of it's done with what's called a drilling frame. And I said, again, what goes on the uh, cutters that go on here are called cutting frames. There's another one that's done with the drilling frame. And this, these are all practice pieces that I did. This is done with the horizontal cutting frame. Now, do you need to use harder wood because of the intricacy of the design? Yeah, if you can use dense wood, it works good. This is just Corian it's with a horizontal frame. And those are all done, I think, with one, one uh, cam. These are done using two cams. Do not hurt anything, they're just test pieces. We only you need to use two cams in order to do ellipses, right? No, to do. Let me see if I can find you know, That design right there is done with two cams. Okay. And is there, there's really no limit to how many nodes you choose, whether it's 7, 8, 20. It's just a function of the cam. I can't remember the number. Fred, the, the guy I was talking about his website, he's retired. He went, he's, uh, his background, he got his degree as an engineer and got a business degree and built and sold houses. But he still knows how to calculate. He has four cams and he tried to figure out the possibilities. It was over two million different possibilities. Right, because if, then I'll show you. If you're on one side of the center, you get one pattern. If you're on the if you're on the front side of the center, you get one pattern. If you're on the back side of the center, you get another pattern. Yes. What are cams? I'll show you. I'll show you right now. This is about half of what I have. I've done. Come up with. This almost reminds you of a spleen, mm -hmm. spline automotive. Mine are made out of Corian. Uh, the ones you can buy them from uh, Lindau and White. I think they're made out of uh, plexiglass. Complete? Yeah. They're, they're going to actually make this thing divide. And you can have anything that you want. Um, you can stack cameras?
but you have these cut out on CNC. Yeah. Yeah. But you can do them however which way you want. Um, Fred also belongs to the Society of Ornamental Turners. That's a group in England. Uh, and all, this, all the ornamental turning groups aren't very big. Um, they've got an Ornamental Turning International. I think I have their website on there. That's another good place to go. Uh, that's, that's a U.S. group, and there's actually a couple of, uh, there's one person from uh, Australia, there's a person from, I think it's Yugoslavia. Anyhow, there's 102 people that go, that are members on that website. <laughs> okay, this, is a, this is a big group up there. But anyhow, the Society of Ornamental Turners, they've been keeping uh, minutes to all their meetings since 1948. I think even before that, I've got all their, their, their bulletins. And I was trying to figure out, well, what, what I wanted to do was make a butterfly using a rose engine. So you should be able to make a template to do that. Uh, so I thought all you got to do is draw a butterfly, expand it out, and it would work. It doesn't work. And then after you learn how, after you have to actually figure the, uh, the reasoning, it doesn't work. Um, but I did it. After I read one of their bulletins, that's the template. It does that butterfly. The, the one in, in the very center is the one I wanted to, to do. So you can see it, and what's happening is you're changing, you're actually pivoting your, your, your design, your piece around that design, so it creates some real strange stuff. And that's done with the drilling frame, and this is done with the horizontal cutting frame. And what's the numeric index there? That number, that's where the center line is. But that's not the center line of my machine. Now, when I first set this up, I couldn't get it to work. It should have, but it bugged me for a long time. Uh, you can't set this to the center line of your machine. Like I say, this thing is traveling like this as it's turning. Um, someplace in between the lowest spot and the highest spot is where you'll get that design to have to be that number. That's why I wrote it. I took a picture of it. I wrote it on here because if I lose it, it took me lots of hours to come up with that. But it can be done. So, question. Uh -huh. Can you make your own cam? Yeah, all so my cams can, I made. So you can make a cam with like, uh, like hundred, uh, 200 little. Yeah. You could. Um, Pretty certain you've seen the, uh, the fireman symbol. It's like a, like an iron cross looking thing. It has some stuff in it. Uh, something similar to that. There's been some questions about whether they can make a cam to do that. Fred and I know it can be done. And I think uh, if they don't get it figured out, Fred may be going to Pennsylvania to show these guys how to do. <laughs> so theoretically, any symmetrical design you ought to be able to do. Yes. The, the butterfly, you can see how much from the very lowest point to the very highest point, that's going to create a lot of motion in this head. Okay? It's just about as much as you want to do. And if you design it, if you come up with a design, a flower, you find a, um, I want to do a dogwood as soon as I can get time to do it. I've been trying to do that for a long time. In fact, you'll see a lot of these almost come to like a dogwood. You say, okay, I want it to be that big. That's what you designed. It came around. Now, it will do design, but it will do that design the best for what you want. Do it smaller, you can do it bigger. Because you'll you'll start to lose that. So the, the material this that these cans are made of has to be fairly hard. Yeah, you don't want it to wear out. I've seen them made out of uh, plywood, plexiglass. The 
expensive ones, the uh, Holtz Apple, those guys made them out of brass. They machined a lot of brass back in those days because that's what they had. This is my favorite cutting frame. spins horizontally and if I've got another piece that I can bolt in here and actually turn it that way and it becomes a vertical, that's how I do these patterns. It flips up and it, it does, I do a thing called phasing. And I'll, I'll show you that too. We'll have to do that. And normally I would turn something on the lathe, turn, 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 and this, this duplicates the spindle of my lathe, which is bigger than this one. Turn, do whatever, unscrew the whole piece, chucking everything, and screw it up here, and then do my decoration. And I may have to go back and finish doing something, um, but I don't take it out of that chuck till I am completely done. You lose concentricity. Mm -hmm. And it's very important because our, our cuts aren't generally that deep. So, instead of doing that, I made up some pieces. Some MDF drilled and tapped it to fit this and then glued some pieces on it and turned it on my lathe and put it on. We can do this because it'll work. Center is important for some things. Um, I don't know if I have anything out here. Will that, will that work? If it's not centered, uh, it throws your pattern off, off center. I mean, that makes sense, right? One guy calls it a tornado effect. Um, and it just increases the possibilities. And this creates very fine dust. Let's show you guys this puppy. When this thing uh, is ready to use, these fingers here, uh, followers in uh, the rose engine world, these are called rubbers because they rub against the cam, which is called a rose end, a rose head in the, in the world. They'll actually cause this head to pop or to rock, if you, if you can see that happening. That's what gives you some of the real. Nice designs. You can see how offset. 
center that is. You can come up and look around. This is set very low. That pattern is. And a lot of times I'll use a piece like this to keep adjusting until I get to center. But I have to know where center is. Or at least pretty close. So you had to make those cutting tools yourself, basically? Yes. He knows the distance from the table up to the center of the spindle. So he's measuring the tool in the same dimension. But in the, the cutting, actual cutting. Yeah, you can adjust that up and down. Yeah, I didn't make this. This Some of this stuff is store-bought. But the cutting bits, um, they can be any shape you want. I just happen to have few cutters in there. Got a left and right hand for doing one thing. There's the one I, this is called uh, basket weave. Basket weave cut, where you scoop it out. That's what I use that one for. And a lot of stuff you have to just experiment and try to figure out now how did they do that. This is one of the most popular ones. Um, there's another one. I don't do it because it's way too hard for me to do it on mine. If I, if I could index it and lock it, come in and cut, index lock it, cut in and cut. Or if my head pump. You see these ones that have like these spirals going, circles going all the way around that are interlocking. It's called barley corn. Um, go to Fred's website. He does a real good job of doing that. With this. Yeah, I've been waiting for this motor to crap out. I've used it so see this but other than that little screw up that I had. Now the other thing to keep in mind, not that it's real important, we're in the 21st century now. In the 1700s, 1800s, when folks were pumping this thing, there was a belt going up here, going across, there was a belt coming down here and going through some other pulleys that was causing all this stuff to spin faster than what I was doing there. I mean, it'd be an ocean nightmare today if you did uh, <laughs> try to sell a machine like that right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be tricky to do. You have more guards than you would. Uh, oh, yeah, you couldn't run it. So would they ever run that stuff off line shafts later on, Roland? No. Uh, it just wasn't enough of them. Oh, they always ran it off of a treadle? I have not seen any that wasn't run off a treadle. Well, one thing, you're trying to control some pretty, pretty elaborate stuff. Um, on ornamental lathes, you were indexing and stopping and then cutting and indexing yeah. and stopping and cutting. Do a lot of that by hand. Uh, when I get this one done, I've got so many changes I want to do to it. I'll have an indexing plate back here. I'm going to replace this with the indexing plate so I can be able to lock it, come in and do some stuff, index it, lock it, come in and do some stuff. And then I'm going to have it to where my table pumps. And I'll have, or 
rods coming out here to hold it the center. So now that a, 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 a post, a round piece between the centers, I can do you know, that long if I want to. I'll probably make a tool handle, and that'll be it. I just want to see if I can do it, that kind of thing. We'll have you come out in the next two years and demo it for us. Yeah, that's right. I want this to make you feel do threading on this one. And that's one of the things, uh, it's partly the beginnings of uh, metal threading was some of the things they developed off of Rose engines. Uh, an interesting story, I think, here's another historical fact is uh, they couldn't figure out why on Holtz Apple engines, even their uh, ornamental legs, they had, I can't remember what it was, 9.75 threads per inch, and then they would do, this, this was their standard thread, and they had interchangeable stuff, which was, in those days, was actually pretty incredible. But his stuff would fit his stuff, and other people's wouldn't. And you had something like 12 and 0.3 threads per inch, some silly stuff. So some wise researcher found out that uh, they were using what's called a Strasbourg inch. And I've been doing machining for over 40 years. I've never heard of a Strasbourg inch, but it, it, I looked it up. It's, it's there. A Strasbourg inch is equal to 1.05 inches per inch. <laughs> and I suspect he used that because uh, originally his family came from that area. They moved from Germany someplace to England. Uh, and they actually set up shops there. They used inches instead of meters? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, they didn't yeah, come right. out until way late. same cam. I could change the cam and do another count. Um, what I'm going to do is to show you, I'm going to cut that pattern on this side. I'm going to move it to the other side and cut that pattern just so you can see that it's going to be different. Now with that one cam, I've already done if I went high, went low, went to center with the horizontal frame, went high, went low, went to center with the drilling frame, there's six possibilities. And if I cut on this side with all those, that's six. Well, on that side, now that's nine. If I took the horizontal cutting frame and went on that side and cut some stuff, I also would have six other possibilities there. Uh, just to give you an idea, that's just with this one. And if I move out here, I'm going to get some other stuff. It's pretty spatial things. <laughs> Are you at the point where you can know ahead of time what it's going to look like, or do you have pretty to close? I wish, I swear, I, I left my toolbox. I don't know why I packed early. Um, left my toolbox, my treasure piece. It's the, there's only one other guy in the country that's done it, and they can't figure out how he did it. I did. Did you do it? If you look at. Uh, Look at this one. Uh, but I did it with three colors is the one that I have at home. And I left it. Uh, but I did it. <laughs> I'll probably take a look at myself. Wow. other stuff. Uh, I did a little piece. I do a lot of experiment. There you go. 
pass this one around. This was all done with that cutter and that cutting frame. I just got close on the bottom and made a fancy funnel. The idea was to have that a design in the bottom. Okay. So what do you think, Ed? Fantastic. <laughs> what I'm looking at there is three pieces of wood. No, that's two. The one that I have at home is three. Yeah. I, was counting, I was counting your base piece and it looked like two inlays. Ah. One inlay. Yeah, that is fantastic. The, uh, well, it's an inlay. Lamination. It's only 30 seconds. Okay, this is the same cam, same center line. And again, you get and you get all that all cam. And again, I could do stuff by going deeper, coming in, going deeper, coming in, going deeper. In the 1700s, the, uh, just to give you an idea how they did a contour and, and made it real consistent.